This, of course, is a 2016 Mazda Miata, the MX-5, if you will. But if you're a Mazda fanatic, you'll know this car as the ND, the fourth generation model. The first one was the NA, NB, NC, ND. And if you're really into Mazda history, you're going to love what's coming up next because we had a chance to listen to Bob Hall, one of the fathers of this car, talk about the very first days of the NA Miata. And that is coming up next on the Fast Lane Car. Tom came back and they said, oh, is it good? And he said, no. And Tom pushed and we got a clay studio. We could do one car. So we did the first clay car. Now, it was just called Lightweight Sports. We had no engineering support to speak of. The vehicle dimensions were based on the rear axle of a first generation RX-7. And everything had to be scaled from that. So welcome, Tom. We got a clay model. And this is what we got out of it. This was the first 3D manifestation of the car. Uh, again, with the RX-7 track and with a set of 626 wheels on it. And you notice we kind of followed the theme of the design pretty well from the drawing. Uh, we, of course, showed it to management, as you would, where they kind of went... Um, <laughs> anybody who's worked for a Japanese company is that. And we put it against the, the rivals of the time and previous, like the Elan, and of course the CRX convertible. If you blinked, you missed it. Um, looked at it, took it. And we sent it to Japan with a hard top because all the other cars were coupes. And we went in what was called offline go go. Go go in Japan means 5 5, but it also means go go. Like go 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 speed racer. Okay. And we went against, from left to right, a front engine front drive car that was done by the guys at Hiroshima, a mid engine car that was done by the blokes at the Tokyo studio, and our car. Here's shown with the top off because at the end of the presentation, we pulled the top off. The program guy for the mid-engine car, a guy named Yoichi Sato, who is probably the only guy at Mazda as crazy as I was, stood up and said in English, hey, build that one. <laughs> so there was, there was no intention to build a car, but we won the competition. And we were pretty happy. It was called the Club Sport, and it became the Club Racer. But this was, uh, when we launched the car at the Chicago Show in 1989, uh, we figured, like any new launch, you're going to have to have something sp a little snazzy. So, started working on this, and we had a very early car that was a, an, uh, I think it was a, a very late prototype. It was even before pre-production, so we couldn't sell it. So we, we took it. Mark Jordan and company kind of ripped the body off, and they did this really nice job on on bulging the fenders rather than adding a set of fender flares, and um, shot it yellow. Originally, we wanted we wanted five colors at launch. We wanted the red, the white, the blue, we wanted this yellow, and we wanted British Racing Green. For a number of reasons, they only gave us red, white, and blue. The yellow had issues with coverage in the factory. So yellow worked as a special edition where they could control the volume, but didn't work in mass production. The British Racing Green worked better with a tan interior. We wouldn't have a tan interior for a couple of years, so we held that. But we brought this to the, uh, before we brought it to the show, the program manager for the MX-5 came, and he was a little unhappy with it. And at first, we couldn't understand why. In Japan, when you launch a new car and you have something like this, the Japanese tend to see show cars in a binary context. If it's a completely different car that is obviously just a concept, it's just a concept car. But they see something like this, they think, when is it coming out? And here I saw an approach to that. But in America, they see this, it's like, oh, it's a show car for the thing, the launch. In the end, he was real happy with it. And we got, got good exposure, and it's completely drivable. This is a real car. This is not just. Someone's blocked up, but because it's such an early car, it can't be sold, so it's in the Mazda collection. Too bad, everybody. Why did you pick uh, Chicago to launch? Um, at the time, Detroit was pretty antagonistic towards imports, to be absolutely honest. We actually thought about Detroit. We couldn't do Los Angeles because in those days, Los Angeles was, was too early. And to launch in Los Angeles would be too late. So we basically had a choice of Chicago. Uh, New York or Geneva. Geneva was out because the European sales of the car weren't going to start till probably sometime late in 90. So um, they went and they talked to New York, or talked, sorry, not New York, uh, Chicago and Detroit. They talked to Detroit and the Detroit people were like, yeah, meh, meh, meh. and the Chicago guys said, yeah, sure. So we got a nice spot in Chicago. You know, okay, it worked out pretty well. And, you know, uh, the other thing, there were two other cars launched. There was the NSX and there was the uh, 300ZX. And the NSX was interesting because everybody was saying, oh, the NSX is going to be the star of the show. 
And I remember I had a friend of mine at Honda who looked at our car and said, we have the star of the show. You have the star of the market. <laughs> so we went back to Japan and Japan did something they have never ever done, did before. They took the clay model concept, they packed it off to an outfit in England called IAD, and they made a full scale running version of the car. You could get in it, you could drive it, the windows went up and down. You know, it was a little under a million bucks, but we thought it was a good deal. Now, after, as this car is being done, Japan gets serious and gives us an engineer. And the engineer gave us a package, so we did a second clay model. Okay? This is on a package real close to the car you guys know from 1989. The full-scale runnable car is finished in England, and they got to send it to Japan. And the guy in charge of the full-scale project, Matsui, said, let's take it to California. And we put it next to the new clay model. Now, it looks bigger. And you have to understand that car is like 12 feet away. So to give you an idea how much bigger it looks, this kind of puts it into perspective. Okay? It was bloody huge. And the reason was we had to design it around an RX-7 rear axle. And the new car was going to be new bits and pieces. So when you have an unapproved project that's top secret and a million dollar car, what do you do with it? That's right, you put it on the back of the truck, okay, and you drive to Santa Barbara, California and take the sheet off and look at it as people drive by going, what the? And of course, the other thing you do is you take it to a shopping center to see if you can get door dates. Okay, this weird strategy, when the car went back to Japan and management saw this thing that you could get in and steer and all, they bought off on the project. They said, okay, we're going to do this. All right, so now we've got the next year, 1990. Yeah, late in 1990, uh, Mazda was getting ready for a new car called the MX-3. And it was a little sporty hatchback, um, a little bit like, for lack of a better term, imagine a, a baby Ford probe kind of thing. And they wanted to do it in some very unusual and vivid, vivid colors. So they didn't want to show the car, but they wanted to show the colors. They took six Miatas and they took nine 323 hatchbacks and painted them these very wild colors. This was a teal that was called H4143. It was a non-production color, so it only had a code number. The other five cars were, there was one that was a Lamborghini Miura orange, and we used the Lamborghini Miura paint. There was another one that was a Porsche ice green. We used the Porsche paint. Then there were some that were in new paints. One was a magenta color, kind of a uh, raspberry. One was a kind of electric blue. And then the last one was this pale metallic yellow. That um, There were two issues with it. One, it, we didn't think it looked very good, and it got the nickname Metallic Pus. And the other problem was when the car was painted, they painted the cars, uh, they took body shells off line that had been primed. They took them to the prototype shop and painted them at the prototype shop. So if you look inside here, yeah. Looks like it was driven. There's a lot of... This, uh, this car has, has 50,000 miles on it and is driven, but it's all teal underneath. So it's the only one in the world in this car. Only one like this, just like the others, the only metallic pus or raspberry or whatever. But so they came back to us. Now, our former boss of the design department, Mr. Fukuda, um, because he was able to keep Tom and I in line so well, became head of design. And Tom is running the studio. And Fukuda says, OK, guys, do a model. So we went back to the original theme and did this. Now, that's pretty close to the production car. Okay. Um, 1600S was one of the names we had for it. Really rolls off the tongue, right? Doesn't it? But the car was going to go. We had approval to build it. It was going to be in production. We were like the cat that ate the canary. There's a bunch of guys here. Uh, the skinny ones framed by the two large ones. Uh, from left to right, it's uh, Huang Chin, who is now in Taiwan, uh, doing design for uh, <laughs> Lexan, uh, a Taiwanese company. Norman Garrett, who's in the back of the room standing there, who hasn't changed the prick. It's, I got go to I go to Norman's attic. There's got to be a painting up there, OK? <laughs> Koichi Hayashi, uh, who is, uh, he moved up in Mazda, he's, he's retired, isn't he? Yeah. Okay, and just some old, fat, old guy. So the clay model was sent back to Japan, and Fukuda saw it, and he says, yeah, but it's as fat as Bob is. <laughs> so Fukuda's guys in Japan took that clay model, and they started shaving bits off of it. Now you look at this, this is basically the production car. I'll go back to the other one for a minute where you can see where they fix it. You look at the front, they tighten the nose up. The intake got a little more accentuated. That was the original. All right, Bob, so now we've jumped ahead in time to 1996. And look, no convertible. That's right, that's right. This, this is an interesting, has an interesting story behind it. Yeah. 
When we were doing the program back in the mid 80s, as we had pretty much finalized a lot of the design work, Japan got very nervous about the idea of the car being available only as a convertible. So they said, can you study a coupe, please? Now, from a planning standpoint, we looked and we knew it was going to work, but they just didn't, nobody believed it. So the design department. You have. It's all right. It's okay. So, we're good at it, don't worry. So the design, the design department started working on a coupe. We came up with a draft and we agreed, and they began working on this coupe project. They did the coupe up in clay, did the whole roof on the car, and they had a car, old clay model they used. Then they did a thing called a splash, and a splash is where you take this car, you put a material on it, you lay fiberglass over it with a frame so you can pull it off, and then you have the mold to do a new fiberglass roof. Before, just before they finished the splash, we got word from Japan, it's okay, we don't need it. So Tom Matano, with a lot of foresight, although at the time, I think it was just like, they said, take the splash and let's put it in the basement. Okay, so they put the splash in the basement. 1996 is coming along, Japan hasn't got any show cars that can be done, no concept cars. They haven't had time to do one, and they say, we need a concept car. So, take it out of the basement. so coin drops, the light goes on over Tom and Mark's head, they take the splash out, they do the splash, they put the car here. The body sides here, which are relatively flat, they put a nice curve, they rolled it all in. After that clay model was done, they built a model just like this, the so-called design model. And we showed it in Pasadena to the public. And they kind of went a little a poo over it. Um, that's basically the production car, other than door handles and the top boot cover. Fukuda-san was so happy, he you know, put the, the badge on it. That's our former chief of design, uh, Shigenori Fukuda. And after that, we had a car. So I guess you could say all the work I did, this is the end of the beginning, and it's all gone from there. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. There will be questions later on, but I will answer two questions now. Uh, eight and a half D, and only on days of the week that end in the letter Y. So there you have it, the secret sauce. The winning combination for the Mazda Miata is that less is more. Less power, less design, less everything. And in the end, you get a very elegant and yet very fulfilling and fun car to drive. As always, this is Roman reporting for the Fast Lane Car. Check out tflcar.com for more news, views, and of course, everyday reviews. Thanks for watching.